Good boy. Well, Benny and I are stuck today. Stuck inside, that is. Uh, there'll be no shooting, there'll be no carpentry. Everything is gonna be indoors because uh, we've got a string of weather going through from Kentucky all the way up to Maine and central New Hampshire is getting clobbered with thunderstorms and some serious torrential rains. So here we are. But I want to talk to you today about magnum cartridges. So you're going to say to me, well, where's that coming from? Because uh, you're, you're opposed to magnum cartridges. Well, lest I be accused of being anti-magnum, uh, let me first of all go back over my years of magnumitis, you might say. I had, I had, I had some serious magnum cartridges. Uh, first of all, I had a, uh, for a short while, I had a 458 Winchester Magnum in a, in a single-shot Ruger. That was a fascinating cartridge to shoot. In fact, I used to enjoy shooting it. It was, uh, it was, it was one of those things, you know, you could show and tell, just, just have fun shooting it in front of your buddies and everything. And um, it was uh, not, as, not as punishing as you might think. The 458 kind of rolls back, a lot of, lot of rocking and rolling, but it's, it's, not, it's not a high velocity cartridge. It's at 2,100 feet per second, so it's more of a big time push. Uh, that was a fun cartridge to shoot that I had for a short while. And uh, then, uh, then we had the mighty uh, 416 Remington. Why I ever got this, I haven't got a clue. But, uh, and I kept it for a very brief period of time. After the first few shots of it, I said, I, I, don't, think I, I don't think I need to have that. It wasn't fun to shoot. It was a, it was a very heavy recoiling, sharp recoiling uh, cartridge. Um, just a side note, when I attended the uh, armorer school at the Ilian, New York Remington factory back in the 90s, um, they showed us, they took us on a tour through the plant and uh, they showed us at the end of, at the end of each workstation, each, each individual workstation, there was a reinforced plywood box that was filled with uh, sand and I believe maybe Kevlar inside, the, inside it. It had been ballistically tested to absorb uh, an accidental discharge from any rifle that, uh, from any cartridge and rifle combination that Remington produced at the time. Until they came out with the 416 Remington. The 416 Remington passed right on through without stopping. So it's a very, very significant uh, penetrator in that regard. Anybody who's looking for a, uh, you know, you, you try a 416, it's uh, no longer medium bore, it's, uh, it, it's a large bore cartridge, 40 caliber, uh, and it, it's, it's a very heavy penetrating round. Uh, anything in that class or above is certainly uh, ample. But anyway, I, I had that for a short period of time. I dispensed with it. It wasn't fun. Uh, and I certainly had no need for such a cartridge. I wasn't planning on going after dangerous game or, or uh, large bears. Then I had a, I had a 375 H&H &H Magnum. That was, to me, uh, that was the epitome of uh, fun Magnums. Um, it was accurate. It was long range, 270 grain bullet. It was extremely uh, flat shooting, long range cartridge. Uh, and it and it wasn't it wasn't a hard it wasn't a hard hitter on the shoulder. Um, I think that uh, I, I I certainly have fired more more nasty uh, cartridges in my life, uh, including that 416. Uh, but this you know in in my single shot uh, I should say in my uh, 700 Remington uh, Safari grade rifle that was a fantastic uh, combination. It was uh, it was a beautiful gun. Select Walnut, uh, custom made uh, in the uh, Remington shop, in the uh, custom shop, uh, with an ebony four-end tip, uh, hand-cut checkering. It was a gorgeous, gorgeous gun, big. It was, I think it had a 20, 25 or 26-inch barrel, I can't remember. But it was a, it was a big gun, uh, suitable for anything on earth, uh, from really, I mean, with the with the correct ammunition loaded down, you can certainly take it deer hunting. But it's a big, big gun to be carrying around in the woods for deer. But anyway, I had that for a while, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, it had no practical use for me, uh, but the one that did have some practical use was my 300 Winchester Magnum in my uh, Seiko, and uh, that was a that was a very, very accurate rifle, long range cartridge, and uh, it did a nice job on elk. Um, 
especially with 200 grain uh, nozzle petitions uh, that I, I liked. I know the 180 is, it tends to be the more popular, uh, but the 200, I think, uh, actually, I think the 200 had a little bit less of a sharp kick. Uh, I think the recovery time was a little, recovery was a little bit quicker with the 200 grain bullet it became, because it was a little bit slower velocity. But anyway, it was a great cartridge and uh, very useful cartridge for uh, anybody who's going after elk if you want to have something uh, a little bit more you know a little bit more formidable than the uh, typical 3006 which i mean essentially a, you know a, a 300 winchester magnum or anything in that particular class is a is, is just basically a 3006 on steroids it does it it, it brings a 3006 farther down range the usefulness of it. it gives you another 150 to 200 yards more useful range. So anyway, but what I want to talk about with Magnum cartridges is uh, what you should keep an eye out for uh, when you're, oh here we are again, we're, we're, starting, to, we're starting to rain again. Uh, but I want you to understand uh, the differences in construction with the various uh, Magnum cartridges and uh, what you should at least be aware of before you uh, go out and, and purchase one. Um, for, uh, for the many, many years, uh, beginning through the, the very late 50s and uh, through the 60s and 70s, uh, the word magnum, when it came to a rifle cartridge, meant that it had a belt. That was, that was just par for the course. And that was based upon uh, the, the origin of it came largely from the 375 H&H &H Magnum, Holland and Holland. Uh, this cartridge was designed in 1912. It was this, actually the second uh, belted magnum that came on the scene. Holland and Holland previously had, it was the uh, 375 uh, Velopex, or Velopex, and uh, sometimes called the uh, 400-375 Express. Um, those, uh, that particular cartridge fell on his nose because uh, the, Germans, the Germans had at the same time come out with a, uh, uh, it was a 9.3 by 65, I think it was, and that was a, that was a far more potent cartridge. It was uh, more uh, readily accepted by the uh, African hunting crowd. Um, so a few years later, seven years later, uh, Holland and Holland came out with the uh, 375 H&H &H Magnum and basically uh, rewrote history when it came to uh, Magnum cartridges as we know them in this country. We basically inherited our Magnums from the British for the most part from the 375 H&H uh, &H Magnum case. And this, w this is what brings us to uh, the belt. If you look at this particular round, you can see it's got a very, very, very small, i bring it up even closer, it's got a very small shoulder, a very, very uh, subtle taper to that shoulder. Um, that, does not, that does not provide adequate head spacing against the uh, firing pin driving forward, or even, even a cartridge being uh, swiftly chambered. It could, it could upset the head space and drive the cartridge case farther into the chamber than uh, was desired and give excess headspace. And that could mean that the, the gun, first of all, might not fire, the firing pin might not reach uh, if it was driven in, you know, slammed in too far. And which could easily be the case if you're uh, in a, you know, in a dangerous game situation and you're, you're throwing that bolt forward in a hurry, that heavy bullet's gonna pull that cartridge in there and wedge it in. So uh, they had to have, uh, they had to have something that would withhold that cartridge case to the rear. And to back up a little bit, the reason why that case was slender in its, in its shape, long, long taper, uh, was, was simply because of the type of powder that uh, they were using at Holland & Holland. They were using cordite. Cordite looks like it was uh, linguine that was cooked up and you know, then it was stretched out and dried again. Uh, it, it, was, it was stringy and long and it was twisty. And uh, I believe they actually had to count the, the number of strands that went in by hand uh, in order to uh, load these. So the shape of the cartridge case uh, would derive from that. But uh, 
Holland and Holland, and and actually there were there were a couple of there were a couple of individuals that that they that they borrowed from, um, that had previously invented but not brought to commercial use uh, a belted case. So Holland and Holland had taken that idea, which essentially creates a rim. That that rim, uh, that that belt. Uh, just forward of the extraction groove limits the cartridge uh, from going into the chamber too far and it gives it its head space. And I, I did a video, a, a very, very uh, detailed video on the various types of head space and what it is. But um, to say that the, to say that the uh, belt is stronger, that a case is stronger than, uh, than one without a belt, not true. That's oftentimes been cited by people that a belt gives it added strength. There's no strength added to the, the cartridge whatsoever because uh, there's, no, there's no powder chamber in that region of the uh, case. Uh, there's, there's no added strength whatsoever. The belt is simply there because of the shape and design of the 375 H&H &H Magnum, which necessitated having uh, that belt in order to feed properly a, a rimmed case uh, would not f feed as, as, as well in a uh, box from a box magazine and also presents a problem uh, you know like the 220 Swift has got a, a semi rimmed case and uh, anybody who has a 220 Swift knows that you have to be very sure that when you stack those rounds in the magazine that each round has to be ahead of the one uh, below it otherwise you'll get a rim hung up on the, uh, the back side of the cartridge below it and it won't feed so those are those are things that uh, Holland and Holland was uh, seeking to uh, remedy by having that uh, that that belted rim that allowed for smooth uh, for smooth cycling uh, and very very positive head spacing. So when when in this country uh, we started developing our own series of Magnum cartridges, heretofore we had been basically uh, chambering our rifles. Winchester had been chambering the Model 70 in uh, the, three, the 300 Holland and Holland and the 375 Holland and Holland. Uh, but in, it, in the late 50s, I think it was 1958, if I'm not mistaken, or 57, uh, Winchester uh, produced the uh, 458 Winchester Magnum. And, you know, at the time there was a uh, there was a lot of interest in uh, safari hunting. People who had returned from uh, veterans who had returned from Europe and from uh, Asia, they they had an interest now in traveling, and travel was becoming a lot easier. Uh, airplane travel was replacing uh, you know steamship travel, so you could get you could get over to Africa or India or places like that and and do your hunting in a week and get home. So Winchester capitalized on that, and Remington started getting into the game with uh, later on. Uh, but with the 458 Winchester Magnum, uh, that belt was very, very useful because, again, as you can see, this is a straight, virtually straight wall cartridge. It's got a, it's got a slight taper to it, uh, but there's no, there's no place to headspace on this case. You couldn't headspace on the, on the uh, edge of the uh, brass because uh, this case needs to be firmly uh, crimped in place. So that would, that would negate having a, a head spacing on the uh, forward section of that uh, case. So the belt was a very, very handy uh, addition to uh, the, the 458 uh, Winchester Magnum. So Winchester simply shortened the 375 case and uh, that was it. And um, it was a very, very small modification. Um, as the, uh, as, as the cartridge development went on and um, the uh, 300 Winchester Magnum uh, replaced the uh, 300 Holland and Holland in their line. Um, they, they retained that same, uh, that, that same case. Uh, it was there. They just, you know, the machinery, they had the machinery to produce uh, the, that belted case with that rim diameter. It didn't need it. Uh, it, it did not need to have that belt because it had sufficient, uh, it had sufficient uh, shoulder angle and uh, si shoulder size in order to uh, provide correct uh, head spacing, the same as any uh, standard cartridge did. But because it had that additional diameter of the body, uh, and because that, because that 
tooling was already in their in their system, uh, that became that became the standard. And as time went on, Remington with the seven millimeter Remington Magnum, uh, you had the two sixty four Winchester Magnum. All those Magnums, they all utilized that same uh, rim diameter and uh, case head. Um, understand also too that. You know, manuf cartridge manufacturers, you know, they're not, they make, they make their own brass. Um, they can make brass in any dimension that they desire. Um, they don't, they, they don't actually take a, they don't take another cartridge and make their cartridge from it per se. In other words, they don't go to the other end of the factory and grab all the 375 H&H &H brass and bring it over here and resize it and make it into uh, to 458 or anything else or three, you know, 300 Winchester Magnum. That's not the way. That's not the way manufacturing facilities work. They're making it from whole brass themselves. But what they do also is uh, they capitalize on the fact that expensive tooling can be used for the first few stages of uh, cartridge case. Manufacture. In other words, during the cup and draw process, uh, you know the same tooling which is used to produce uh, the the beginnings of a 300 Winchester Magnum case or a seven millimeter Remington Magnum case or a 450. No matter what it is, that same cup and draw tooling can be used for the first few stages until they need to draw it out farther or shorter or whatever it is, and you know actually dimension it to whatever taper. But the, the, the initial tooling, uh, which is very expensive, uh, can, can remain set up. There's also set up time involved. So that same tooling can be used uh, for the manufacturer for starting any number of cases. So that's why we have uh, belted magnums. Um, belted magnums uh, have a particular uh, difficulty with them. Anybody who is hand loading. Now, if you're not a hand loader, this is of no concern whatsoever. But um, the issue of incipient case head separation or stretching is uh, something which has always plagued the uh, belted magnum case. Just forward of, just forward of that belt by about oh an eighth of an inch or so, maybe uh, three sixteenths of an inch or so. Uh, a lot of a lot of stretching occurs. What happens is the case head itself uh, remains in place. This this is this is peculiar to uh, a belted magnum, because of that because of that belt, the rear uh, the forward movement of that case is limited by the belt, just as if it was a rim, and because of the very high pressures involved, unlike a standard rimmed cartridge like a 3030 and 32 Special and, and, and that sort of cartridge that have rims with a l much lower internal pressures. Uh, with the higher pressures, uh, these, these cases tend to stretch back there just, just in front of that belt. The, uh, the case itself stretches forward and meets up with the shoulder of the shoulder of that chamber. Because they head space on the rim and not on the shoulder, uh, that, that movement, every time you resize a case, you have that same movement and it can be up, the stretching can be up to 20 thousandths, as much as 20 thousandths of an inch. So you have an issue with that stretching causing a thinness, a, a thinning of that brass back here. And it can be quite dangerous because if you have uh, case head separation uh, with such pressures as that, not only do you have leakage of, uh, of gases to the rear through the bolt uh, and back to the shooter, but you also have some damaging effects, gas cutting of the chamber. In other words, that, as I've spoken before, you can have uh, those hot gases can spurt out through a very, very small opening and it creates a, bl a, a blowtorch effect. Uh, on that chamber, and it and it will actually cause a it'll cause a, a uh, circumferal uh, cutting of that chamber. It's not something you want to have, not even once. Uh, you know, I I had I had a, a 3006 one time, which I unfortunately uh, gas cut like that with just one shot uh, when I was shooting some old, aged uh, military ammunition that had been uh, that had actually been. Uh, fired one time and reloaded, and it wasn't my reloads, but it had been fired one time and reloaded, and it was 
old corrosive ammo, and that that corrosive that corrosive priming compound had crystallized the brass and made it very hard. And the first time I fired it, uh, I had smoke coming out of the back of the the back of the action of that uh, nice that nice Remington 700 that I had. And uh, when I opened it up, I I I had that that case was cracked wide open like an egg. Uh, and it caused some, it, it caused a, a deep, uh, a deep pitted region in the inside of my chamber. And what happens when that, when that occurs is that uh, brass from that point on, every time you fire a case, when you extract, uh, you're shearing off the brass that flowed into that, into that pit will be rubbed off and it, it creates, it creates a uh, extraction issue. It creates difficult extraction. Uh, and it ruins the cases eventually. So it ruined the rifle. Uh, you can't polish it out it, it, because dimensionally it has to stay the same. So that's an issue with belted magnum cases. If you're a hand loader, you have to really limit yourself. I don't like to, I don't like to say that, uh, you know, they're not reloadable. Uh, they certainly are. I reloaded many 300 Winchester magnums myself with my, with my Seiko rifle. And uh, I never had a I never had a case head separation because I I, I watch very carefully for what occurs. As as soon as you see a as soon as you see a bright white uh, brass line, it's, it's as if it's as if the the brass had turned white in that in that area. That means it's thinning, and it's it's probably gone already one shot too many. Uh, and I I limited myself to three reloads. Uh, when I should say two reloads, one firing, two more reloads. I just did not want to approach that threshold where I might have a uh, case head separation. There's a way to uh, limit the amount of uh, stretching that you have, and uh, it's not it it's not uh, the best solution whatsoever. Um, you can you can limit your resizing. You can set your you can set your die up, uh, and and gradually resize the case and take a case and test it in the chamber and then size it, screw it down a little bit more, put it back in the chamber. And when the bolt just closes, in other words, when you can feel that bolt just close on the sized uh, shoulder, that will limit the forward travel of that case forward. And it, and it will limit that, it will limit that, uh, that case head separation. But remember, you still have, you still have a, now you have almost a secondary, you have a primary and a secondary uh, head spacing situation, and the brass is always still going to want to stretch forward, just as it does on a regular case. But with a standard case, the entire case goes forward in the chamber when it's slapped by the, by the firing pin, and then is seized at the front, and then the, the case is pulled back all the way, and the, the, the stretching occurs throughout the length of the case. With the belted magnum, it's, it's stopped by that belt and the case stretches forward instead of being pulled backwards. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a dynamic that's uh, entirely different. So uh, it, it does occur. There's nothing you can do about it. So uh, the, problem, the problem in the field with such a thing is that when you have, when you have limited uh, head spacing at the front like that, when you've basically put it to the point, point where the bolt is sliding down Firmly, that's not a that's not a good cartridge to go hunt in the field with because you don't want to have you don't want to have resistance. You want to be able to throw that bolt forward. So that's that's a peculiar uh, situation that you have with uh, belted magnum cases. So along came uh, the 404 Jeffrey discovery. All of a sudden, somebody uh, oh 85 years after the Jeff 404 Jeffrey was uh, invented. Somebody discovered that uh, that would be a suitable uh, case diameter to uh, put a lot of powder in, and because uh, you had to open up bolt face, basically make new bolt faces because uh, these these bolt faces simply are not large enough. But uh, that became the new parent case for a lot of uh, cartridges that are currently on the market now, and uh, it's it basically it's a very very good. Uh, alternative to the belted magnum case. Um, now, you know, there are, there are people who will say that, uh, you know, the short, some of these short magnum cases don't, don't feed as smoothly 
as, uh, as the uh, belted magnum counterparts, which are longer. That may be true. I, I'm not experienced in having any of those 404 Jeffrey-based uh, uh, cases. So I can't say, uh, you know, I, I leave it up to those who uh, have experience with it. That being what, that being what it is, uh, the, the non-belted magnum cases can be a little bit more useful when it comes to the, to the hand loader, be very, very useful to the hand loader because they don't have that issue of incipient case head separation and stretching. So if you're a hand loader and you're looking for a, uh, a 30 caliber magnum, you know, I, I would certainly say that the Remington's version, the, the short action magnum, uh, or Winchester's version, Ruger's version, they're all peas in a pod. Um, but even, even within uh, that bore size, that small 30 caliber bore size, uh, you're talking differences of less than uh, 250 to 300 feet per second for the most part. Uh, with a 180 grain bullet, you're, you're, they're all somewhere between 2,900 feet per second and 3,100 feet per second uh, with, the, with the 300 Winchester Magnum. And I think the 300 Weatherby Magnum boosted up another 100 feet per second. So, and remember, every time you boost that velocity, you're generally increasing your powder capacity. Um, that's, where the, that's where the short action Magnums tend to be a little bit more efficient because they're a shorter case size. Uh, they tend, to be, they tend to use powder a little bit more efficiently. They may be a little bit less powerful or a little bit more powerful depending on the uh, design of the case, you know, the, the, uh, the ultimate diameter of the case. Not all of them are based on the 404 Jeffrey, some are, some aren't. And then, of course, you've got the giant magnums. I really have no use for those whatsoever. They're all, they're all cartridges that, you know, are, are using 95 to 110, 117 grains of powder. I mean, they're ridiculously over, overboard. Uh, serious barrel wear with uh, cartridges where you're pouring that kind of powder down the barrel at uh, high, high pressure and high velocity. You're, you're talking about barrels that have very, very short lifespans. Let me, uh, let me show you something. In fact, I'll, um, some people don't, they, they don't believe me when I say that um, there's, there's a uh, cause for concern when you uh, purchase a, a Magnum cartridge that's uh, really, really overbore. Let's turn right here to the, uh, this, is, this is Hornady's own manual. Um, he says uh, in the second paragraph, there are no free lunches, however, and many 264 Winchester Magnum owners quickly discovered that the price of ultra high velocity is reduced barrel life. Listen to this. This is a, this is a laboratory which they, they produce uh, all the loads that you uh, turn to, to uh, send down range. We burned out several barrels in developing the first data for the 264 Winchester Magnum. Several barrels. I mean, you know, this, there, there aren't that many, there aren't that many loads here. Uh, we're only, we're only talking about a few different loads, uh, and I'm sure that, I'm sure that they probably developed uh, maybe uh, eight or ten rounds per, you know, per load to, to be able to uh, verify uh, velocities and uh, pressures and all that stuff. But when you're talking that they burned out several barrels uh, in order to do that. And there's another one too. Here we go. 223 Winchester Super Short Magnum. And uh, <laughs> it says, we examined the throat of the rifle with a borescope, borescope after approximately 350 rounds. That's not many, 350 rounds and the erosion was significant. This cartridge is hard on barrels. They italicized and bolded that. This cartridge is hard on barrels. And that's, you can see, you can see why. This is, this is an extremely overboard cartridge. We're taking, we're taking a very, very fat, I believe that's the 404 Jeffrey uh, design. And, you know, trying to, trying to push all that powder out through a, a 22 caliber barrel. So, all the, all the calibers which are overbore do it to some degree. These are extreme situations with the 264 and with the uh, 223. So when you start talking about, when you start talking about 
some of these giant cartridges, which are even bigger than the 264 Winchester Magnum, you, you, you're talking about a reduction of barrel life. That might, that might not mean anything to you if you're not a hand loader and you're not, you're not using the rifle for anything except uh, occasional shots uh, in the field. Uh, it, you know, 350, if, if 350 shots will you know, suffice uh, for the life of your uh, hunting experience with that rifle, that's fine, but just keep in mind that, you know, that, that clock is ticking when you're getting, uh, they said that they had significant wear by the time they got to 350. It, was, it didn't take 350 to get wear, it just said they had significant wear at 350. So there was already wear going on from the get-go. So those are things to keep in mind uh, when you're selecting a uh, Magnum cartridge, is watch, watch the uh, powder capacity and uh, the, the, the ratio of bore diameter to, uh, to case capacity. So whether or not you get a uh, belted Magnum case might in some part depend on whether you're a hand loader. You can certainly get a uh, much better case life out of a uh, non-belted Magnum and you can get the same in the same ballpark of velocity, sometimes a little bit less. You know, you're talking only maybe 75 to 100 feet per second less velocity, um, but with the, with the return gain of having a, a cartridge which, you know, you can load more uh, for the same dollar. So that's it. Uh, belted Magnum cases and, uh, you know, your, your large 404, and that, that ilk, um, they're, they're out there and there's plenty to select from right now. Uh, and as I say, I'm, I'm rather a pragmatist, uh, you know, I'm not just an Eastern shooter. I, I've, I've seen that, you know, I've seen that right up that I, that I'm only centered. My mind is somehow locked into the Eastern hunting scene. That's not true at all. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of uh, Western hunting and, uh, certainly I, certainly I enjoy shooting long range. So, you know, I'm not locked into some sort of, you know, 30-30 mentality. That's, that's, a, that's an improper accusation. So uh, I, have, I have all kinds of rifles that shoot at all different velocities, and I certainly had my share of magnums earlier on, uh, which I probably won't have any need for at this point. I still enjoy my, uh, I still enjoy my standard cartridges, you know, the, the 223, the 270, 257 Roberts, 30, and, and you know, 308. Um, those are all, those are all cartridges that uh, you can, you can shoot an awful lot and uh, they're very useful for, for anybody uh, in any part of the country. So thanks for watching. Benny's having a, he's having a good day, I guess, just relaxing. He's not having to be out in the, in this. Uh, sweltering heat. It's been it's been super hot up here. So maybe this rain will bring uh, through some some uh, more uh, livable air for me to work outside. So uh, my work continues on the uh, pavilion. I've been uh, I've been chopping away using my uh, Robert Sorby chisel and my uh, Japanese slick to uh, carve out my uh, details on some of those joints. And uh, the chain mortiser is working great, so I want to show you all those things. So stay tuned, and uh, and if if you're a, if if you're of a mind, uh, I certainly would appreciate uh, your support on my Patreon page. Uh, my patrons have been uh, allowing me to make uh, ammo ammo purchases. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that reminder bell. And uh, God bless.